my questions and it really is just about the formula. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you to slow that shit down. All right, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, all right, let's talk about Bayes' theorem and why it's important. First, what is it? <laughs> it is a mathematical model of all correct reasoning, or all correct empirical reasoning. And um, that sounds like a God formula. Yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't, see, it doesn't give you omniscience, right? All it does is model what you're arguing. Uh, so it can tell you why you're reaching the conclusion you're reaching and whether you're reaching a valid conclusion or not. That's all I can tell you. And if you have ignorance, you know, if, if you're ignorant of everything, that goes into the equation and what you get out of it is the same ignorance that went in. So like it doesn't generate uh, magical knowledge. But all it does is uh, help you trim away invalid reasoning and help you realize what it is that you need to actually get to a reliable conclusion about something. Why do we need a, a formula for that? Doesn't it... Isn't it some parts, a lot of it, common sense? I mean, like, what? Why, well, this why is the thing. Common sense is often counter... See, the truth is often counterintuitive. Common sense is often wrong. So, like, uh, to give me an example, common sense says, okay, I have this theory. I need to go find evidence that proves the theory. Well, we know for a variety of reasons, but including Bayesian reasoning, that that is the worst thing to do. Right. Because you can always... If you go selecting, looking for evidence for your theory, you're always going to find some. So, so you can prove any false theory doing that, right? I see. I can so, see how dangerous that is. Right. You see, yeah. So, so common sense tells you to do it that way. Now, and this is the fundamental realization that, that science is governed by is the opposite of that. And you say like, no, actually, what you need to do is try and prove your belief false, right? And fail. That's the only way that you can be sure that you have reliable results. So you have to do everything within your power to like legitimately try to prove yourself false. Not, not sham proofs. Like don't, don't try to like come up with a straw man to sort of avoid having to prove, disprove your theory. No, ask yourself seriously, how would I seriously disprove this? Like what do I need to look for? What evidence do I need to look for that would disprove this in, in every possible way? And if you can't think of anything like, well, well then how do you know your theory is even true, right? So you really got to look for that. Bayes' theorem explains mathematically and logically why that is, why it is looking for disproof of your theory and not finding it that actually makes your theory more probably true. So if somebody wanted to employ that, how do they start? What's the first step? Yeah, the first step is, uh, well, I mentioned uh, before, like in Christian apologetics, they'll focus on one thing. And you'll have like, if you take, for example, the fine-tuning argument, they'll just focus on that one thing. It's like, oh, look at how improbable this arrangement of, uh, of constants, physical, fundamental physical constants has to be to get stars and planets and therefore life and so on. It's like, that just has to require design, uh, intelligent design, I'd say. Now, okay, so let's say that's your theory. Um, how do you disprove it? Let's say it's that serious. Let's say that's your theory and, and it is false. How would you disprove it? And so you get, well, okay, um, well, what else would cause that? A sort of random chance would cause that. That's one thing. And so, well, how would I prove that it was random chance and not God, right? So you're like, how do you go, how do you disprove your theory? And if you go looking around, eventually you're going to find some things. Like if you actually start putting evidence in that you've been leaving out. So for example, what would a, a if it was a chance accident, what would we expect? We would expect that the universe would really be extremely inhospitable to life. It would just be like just tiniest little bits to sort of randomly accidentally support life, but most of it wouldn't. Uh, and that's what we observe. So you go out and you see like this, uh, the universe is massive, you know, billions of light years in size, uh, billions of years old, and 99.99999% of it is a lethal radiation filled vacuum. Uh, life can't survive in that. Uh, if you look at all the matter, the actual stuff in the universe, 99.9999% of it is stars and black holes and dust clouds and stuff. They're all lethal to life. You can't live in a sun or a black hole or any of this stuff. So you're looking at like there's there's almost and then if you look at the the tiny 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 amount of matter in the universe that can actually have life on it, almost all of it doesn't. It's still inhospitable to life. Uh, and so um, that's what you would expect if it was random chance and not intelligent design. So this actually disproves the intelligent design theory because it's we we observe what we would expect to observe, and it's really weird. Like why would there be billions of light years and, and years of uh, empty space and stars and black holes that are invisible to life. Why would that, like, there's no reason why a designer would make it that way. Rather than just making, like, Aristotle's universe where the entire universe is inhabitable. Uh, you could even have people living in the sun, maybe. You know, it's like, it's right, you know, it's like, uh, but no, what we see is the opposite of this. And another thing you'd look for if you want random chances, if it's random chance, uh, that if life is a, an accident, um, it is a very rare accident. You say, like, yeah, it's very improbable. Uh, and so, uh, if you look at the rise of life on Earth, for example, if that's the case, you would need to see, for that to be the case, you would need to see lots of trials that failed, basically, right? You see, like, there have to be lots of places in the universe where life didn't arise 
And so if you see, and they have to have lots of places in the universe where these chem this chemistry is going on and not producing life. And that's what we observe. We see that like, there's tons of the universe has places where these, this kind of chemistry is going on, but as far as we know, there's no life arising in it. And, uh, and so that's exactly what we'd expect to observe, is this, this vast wasteland of failed attempts to create life. And then, of course, you get that large, you get one random accidental produce. Um, and there may be more, uh, depending on how, how rare life is and how large the universe is and how old it is, and how much stuff is in, how, mon how much of this chemistry is going on. But it's still going to be extremely rare. We would expect it to be extremely rare. And that's what we observe. Uh, that's exactly what you would predict if it was random chance and not intelligent design. And so if you put all this stuff in, and you can show this with Bayes' theorem, that why this actually tanks the percentage. It makes the probability of intelligent design go down, not up. Now, what will happen, this is the other useful thing you can do with Bayes' theorem, uh, with uh, counter-apologetics. What will happen when you point that out is that Christians will then go, well, oh crap, you freaking disproved my theory, but I don't want my theory to be false. So I'm gonna make up a bunch of stuff there are all these excuses for why God would do all these weird things, why he would make most of the world, most of the universe, you know, stars on which life can't live, why most of the universe would be radiation-filled vacuum lethal to life, uh, why life would be so rare and tenuous. Like, why, why would he make that? They'll come up with all these excuses as to why he would do that. And you know, but do you have any evidence that those excuses are true? Like, no, I'm, I'm just proposing that they're the case. But, well, then you don't know they're true, so that you can't assign them a high probability. And if you actually, if you even assign each one of those excuses a 50-50 chance, which is probably way too high, even if it's 50-50, you, you start multiplying them against each other, the probability goes down, 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 doesn't go up. So adding all these excuses makes your theory less probable, not more probable. And so uh, Bayes' theorem explains the logic of this, is why making up excuses to explain away evidence is not an effective strategy, it's not logically valid. And it explains why, when you put all the evidence back in, it can flip the probabilities the other way around. Okay, so then do we start with Bayes' theorem with just what we know or as much evidence as we can gather through some trial testing in the beginning? Um, and then what's the next step after that? Well, ultimately, everything has to go in, right? Okay. That, this, is the, the, this is the main thing. When you have in the equation, you saw the, the B plus E, yeah. right? Background knowledge plus evidence. Those two things contain all human knowledge. You can't leave anything out. If you're leaving something out, your conclusion is incomplete, gotcha. right? Uh, so all human knowledge goes in there. Uh, and that's why, like, that's where a lot of mistakes arise in the use of Bayes' theorem is that people don't fill out everything in there. They leave something out, right? And then they get, so then they get a bogus conclusion. Everything has to go in. Now, you can do this in a, there's a variety of different ways where you can start with an incomplete equation and work your way up. And it's called iteration. You can do, like, keep updating your priors and so on by putting one piece of evidence in, then another, another, and see the effect of it. But you're not done until you put everything in, right? You don't have a final conclusion until it's all in. And that's why... Christian apologetics relies on leaving so much evidence out and pretending it doesn't exist and just focusing on one thing to get the result they want. Uh, and that's invalid, and Bayes' theorem explains why that's invalid. If a, Christian, if a Christian were to present evidence or a theist were to present evidence, because that's what we all want to know that's as right, yeah. theists or religious persons or whatever, we want to know that what we're believing is real, mm -hmm. what evidence would go in there that would increase the probability right. Of, uh, of the God being true. Yeah, uh, I mean, things would have to be different than they are, first of all, right? Like, uh, like the universe would have to be more like what Aristotle imagined and less like what we found it to be, right? So uh, you, can ha you can imagine we could have confirmed, for example, that the Earth is only 6,000 years old, that all species were created at one time, that, uh, hu that humans come from actually two people. You know, like we, we theoretically could have proved, had that been the case, had that actually been factually true, we could have proved all of that. And then that would actually disprove any other natural explanations. There would have to be some sort of intelligent design explanation. And then all we'd be doing is arguing over what's the nature of this intelligent designer. And then you would, you would look at other evidence, like uh, are there uh, Christian uh, healing wings in hospitals where we can restore lost limbs through prayer to a specific god? Like that would very conclusively prove at least there's this one specific entity that is actually doing these things for us. And then you could still debate like what the exact attributes of that entity, but there would no, be no doubt at that point that they exist at least. The question then would be like, are they are they a good being? Are they a bad being? Should we worship them? Should we oppose them? And so on. That would still exist, but then you would still answer those questions by looking at the evidence of the overall interaction of that being with uh, our world and with us and how much that being is uh, supporting human welfare, supporting human justice and things like that. So we could have had a world that had abundant, conclusive evidence of the existence of God. What we found is the exact opposite of that, which is really weird. Like, Why would God make the world look exactly like we would expect it to look if there was no God? That's bizarre, and of course, it's really hard to explain that. Okay, fine. We can put 
everything we know into the equation. And uh, sure, it might look like a bad case for God. Okay, it might look like that. But if you actually spend your life, Richard, if you walk around these streets, I got a few buddies that do healings out on the streets, all right? And they'll, they'll go on Facebook and, and they'll put the, you know, uh, praise God. And they got the person right there saying, mm -hmm. I feel better now. Yeah. yeah. Um, after they've been prayed for. And, and a lot of these uh, persons who have been healed in some way also have an emotional reaction. You know, if you just spent your, your days, Richard, and your, your time in your life, you might actually increase the probability through those type of experiments that your God is actually maybe probably true. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't, that, <laughs> wouldn't that be true? <coughs> well, look what would happen. <clears throat> look what would happen if you actually apply Bayesian reasoning to that question. So you, what you, ha you have an observation. So this is the evidence that certain behaviors cause certain effects, uh, people feeling better, for example. You, what we'd have to ask, you put all the evidence in, is like, okay, so if it's, let's say, Jesus, if it's Jesus, then only like the Jesus ones should work and not the uh, Buddhist ones or the, the Hindu ones and so on. But if all these other religions are having the same effect, causing the same faith healing effect, well, that's contrary evidence. That's not what we'd expect to be the case. It's less likely that that would be the case, right? Uh, so there, but the alternative explanation is, of course, science has found, you know, placebo effect, uh, emotional effect, regression to the mean. We know we can observe certain kinds of conditions can improve under certain psychological circumstances and just statistically inevitably as well. So you can do that. Will you observe this effect? Yes. Then you see exactly. It's exactly what you expect. So on the natural godless explanation, what we see is exactly what we expect. So it's like very probable. But when we do the religious explanation, it's not what we would expect to see. It's, it's, so it's very improbable. So actually, once you put the evidence back in, it flips the other way around. Now, it would be different if, for example, uh, not only only Christian prayers and faith healing worked, but if it worked on things that couldn't be explained psychosomatically, like they were restoring lost limbs and things like that, like things that are like really fundamentally, like there's definitely something going on here that can't be explained by natural science or, or can't be explained by current natural science. There has to be some sort of agency behind this. Uh, and then you could start talking about studying like, well, where is that agency coming from? Uh, but we don't even get there, right? So we don't even get to that point. We don't see anything that's actually genuinely miraculous. When we go looking, we always find it's just psychosomatics or legendary stories that don't hold up once they're investigated. So we don't actually find anything like that. And when you, when you look at it that way, the evidence overall actually reduces the probability of theism not increasing it. So you're saying the miraculous healing game is weak. It is weak, yes. <laughs> well, I still love recommending people Tim Minchin's song uh, about uh, the cataracts of... Uh, was it, I can't, Sam's mom or something like that. Uh, but uh, God healed the cataracts. Uh, Tim Minchin has this great song. I don't know if you've heard it, but you, uh, no. you absolutely must listen to this song. It, oh, is, yeah. it is amazing, where he goes through all the possible things that can explain the story that was told to him that weren't ruled out before. Anyway, it's just, it's a brilliant piece of work. I would suggest everyone listen to Tim Minchin's song. Regional Director of American Atheists, Author of Foundational Falsehoods of Creationism, and Director of the Phylogeny Explorer Project. I'm a science education advocate, but more than that, I'm a counter-apologist vehemently opposed to creationism, because everything any religion believes is either not evidently true or it's evidently not true. And everything the Bible says about science, be it genetics, taxonomy, or the nature of the earth in relation to the rest of the cosmos, is laughably and indefensibly wrong. The reason that the Bible has been shown to be absolutely wrong about absolutely everything that can be verified or falsified at all is that it was written by ignorant, bigoted, superstitious savages who obviously had no idea what they were talking about. But it's not just that the Bible is filled with nothing but absurdities, atrocities, inconsistencies, and contradictions, and upwards of a thousand lies, as Mark Twain put it. Sufficient for me to dismiss it is the fact that there isn't any truth to it, nothing that we can show to be true or even remotely possible. I don't know why anyone would want to convince themselves of anything that isn't evidently even probably true. But what I constantly hear from believers is that it's all a matter of make-believe and that they don't care what the facts are because they don't want to know what the truth is. It's all literally make-believe. 
a delusion defended by lying to yourself and others, citing facts that aren't facts and pretending to know what no one even can know, all to deceive yourself through the power of pretend. Faith isn't a virtue either. It's an assertion of unreasonable conviction that is assumed without reason and defended against all reason. It offers no way to discover the real truth about anything, but it's a great way to stay wrong forever and never have to admit it. That's why I say that faith is the most dishonest position it is possible to have. How do you build a reliable worldview from scratch. How do we know our particular pieces of these worldviews are correct and not someone else's? Live that self-examined life. For those who think beyond boundaries, where is your pride? What's up everybody, Aurel Avinu here with Fully Deconverted, and I want to say a huge thanks to all our donors that made the Carrier Series possible. Donors like Steve Watson, Dan Honschel, Terrell Wolbert, Reality Revolution, Scott Michael Burdage, Sam Stetson, Dino Rosati, and Mitzi Cordell, <laughs> as well as other persons like Nathan Dickey, Kristen Hood, and Peter Smayfield. Those were our executive producers and producers. Again, without you, wouldn't have been possible. Thank you.